So I quickly give you an introduction. Yep. Um, uh, Roland is uh, uh, one of the makers of Return to Dilmun, and now will talk us through the protocol uh, that they uh, developed with uh, the, the four of them. Uh, I think it's the three of them. That's uh, Gunther Seyfried, Roland, and uh, Federico Mufato, uh, and Leo Petsch, Petschko. Uh, only developed the, the codifying software uh, that they used to uh, to turn the pixels of the bull's head into genetic code that that was introduced. Um, so please, Roland, uh, share your screen and um, um, and tell us more. Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Lucas. I will share my screen shortly. I just wanted to say beforehand, shortly before the people that uh, I haven't seen in the last two weeks and that might know me, I look a bit like a pirate now um, because I had a bike accident and I lost two teeth, which are really long from here. And I'm <laughs> waiting for the, um, for the uh, prosthesis and the implants, but that takes a while. So for now, I have this uh, um, a gap uh, between my teeth, <laughs> but it's all fine. Um, I will share my screen let me check this share screen uh, screen two all right right you see my screen now yes yes loud and clear cool yeah um all right i don't see the zoom chat anymore but if you have any questions you can also just uh, uh oh you can open it again. pop in in between um um, yeah, so this presentation will be about the work steps of Return to Dilmun um, and the protocol. And it has some overlap with Günther's and um, uh, Jose's presentation, but that's just for clarity. Um, and, oh, I'll go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so it will be an introduction to the Return to Dilmun protocol. This is actually a picture from the uh, exhibition in Vienna where we also exhibited the laboratory notebook on the table with all our steps. Um, yeah, first as a short introduction again. So um, in Return to Dilmun, we uh, save this image into the DNA, right? And you can store information in, um, for example, on a USB stick and it will be zeros and ones. But then you can also store information into base pairs and it will be in the form of A, T, Cs and Gs. Um, and that's what we did, converting this image of, uh, of the bull's head um, into first into zero to one because it's pixels and, and then converting it into, um, into base pairs, into DNA. Actually, like Gunther mentioned, we didn't do the whole bull uh, head in one time, but we had like four parts of 1950 base pairs because we kind of were reaching the limits of what can be synthesized by um, DNA synthesis companies. Um, but so that's what we did. We took an image, we synthesized the DNA, we modified the DNA, and then um, that modified DNA was sequenced again to get an image because we had the sequence again and we could put it in the software to get an image. Um, using CRISPR Cas, this is a big bit of a um, uh, repeat of what Jose just said, but um, just to be clear, so we use this uh, this Cas9, um, this blue Cas9 protein, right? And um, the part which we designed actually is the guide RNA, which is purple in this picture. And um, what we do is we cut up this bull's picture and um, we actually take one part out because we cut it in two places and we insert another part, just like in this picture, the donor DNA, which is uh, a green here. Um, and then we have a repair mechanism, which is in our case, is fusion PCR. Um, yeah, which we sequence again to get the DNA, to get the image. Um, yeah, so originally CRISPR is then used in, uh, indeed in bacteria as their kind of immune response to these bacteriophage viruses. Uh, and of course, a couple of years ago, uh, researchers thought, hey, this is nice. We can also use this in a bio lab to cut very precisely uh, where we want as researchers even got the Nobel Prize this year because of this, um, we, yeah, you could say invention, but it's also kind of a, a co-optation from the, from the um, bacteria, right? Uh, and to think about it, we could use this as well in, uh, in research. Um, 
Yeah, so CRISPR has these two components. Um, you have the guide RNA, which is actually um, part of, it has multiple pieces. Um, so as you see here, you have in the green, the um, CR RNA and the other RNA part, which, um, and the, um, so the one part of the RNA is designed such that it binds to the Cas9 uh, protein, which is the which is the pink blob here, which is the protein that actually cuts, and then um, and in the other part of the of the uh, RNA is designed to match a specific twenty nucleotide region, which is basically like your word processor like search and replace in words, so you can kind of search very uh, precisely in the DNA, and then Cas9 will cut exactly there. And this is why the system is so nice because. Um, you can uh, just design this guide RNA to 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 cut where you want uh, to cut. And um, in our cases, we don't use cells, but it's all in vitro. We actually add the Cas9 proteins, and uh, um, we make the guide RNA. So we put them together in a tube, and they cut the cut the DNA. Yeah. And uh, to repeat the process of the of the first experiment of Doom with Dilmun, um, there's the bull's head picture. And basically, what we did is what we done is we kind of um, well, this is converted into uh, into a long DNA string, right? So like from the when you read it out from the top left corner to the bottom right, basically it's like one big string, actually in four pieces. But it's like it's, it's a linear uh, molecule, the DNA. And uh, we target this one part where we cut, so we cut before it and at the start of it and at the end to remove um, um, kind of the closed eyes of this bull picture. And um, we add a, a new fragment, um, which has a different DNA code, which translates into open eyes. And we uh, paste that in. So it's fused together again. And then um, this is kind of desired outcome of the uh, Dilmun experiment that, that uh, to sequence it and that the bull has uh, open eyes instead of closed eyes. Yeah, now I'm going to take you to the different work steps we took. Um, this is actually a picture of the exhibition in Vienna. This was, I think, the first, one of the first roles on the big flip chart we had in the open wet lab, where with Federico, we were kind of writing all the, all the steps uh, and, and kind of debugging and uh, checking what, yeah, um, all the steps we were gonna do and how, how to make this work. It's cool that also this is part of the whole documentation of the project. Um, yeah, roughly speaking, um, there's five w steps, um, and I will go into each of them with a little bit of more detail, a bit more granular. Um, but the five steps are first the creating of the experiment and the ordering of the DNA parts. Um, second one, the amplification of the DNA fragments that's done with PCR, as we mentioned uh, um, before already. Third one, the uh, guide RNA synthesis, and these um, are the guide RNAs that were mentioned earlier um, are needed in the CRISPR cutting because they tell like the system exactly where to cut. Uh, fourth step is actually the, the Cas9 cutting. So we cut the DNA. And the fifth step is the fusion PCR to fuse the new part um, that's amplified in. Um, so we have the new edited bull's head and that's then sent to sequence to have a um, result. And actually what we would do now in this uh, hybrid lab reenactment or kind of revisiting of Dilmun is um, the step uh, three and four. So we're gonna do the, on Monday, we're gonna do the guide RNA synthesis and a Cas9 cutting uh, and then see on an on a electrophoresis gel, whether it had worked. Um, yeah, so to go to the steps, first the first one, which is the creating of the experiment and the ordering of the DNA parts. Um, well, basically the first step uh, was, um, like Gunther already mentioned, the, the design of the image, um, which in this, yeah, is based on the bull's head in Dilmun. Um, and also the design of the image also entailed kind of the thinking about how big it could be and um, yeah, what, what were the constraints on the, on the techniques we used um, to synthesize it into DNA, which is step two. Um, because as yeah, as we discussed earlier, it, it looks pixelated, but that's because to to make it like an image, um, to make it to make the pixels so small that you would not see the individual pixels, means in our case that the, the fragment 
that would have to be synthesized would be really long and um, and there's quite some limitation as to what can be synthesized um, also without errors actually one anecdote is um, so we had a bool bool head we had in four fragments four bool fragments and uh, Günther got a phone call from Eurofins which was our sequencing company um, and he thought everything was finished so he came to Amsterdam only later to realize that uh, I think one or two of the bool fragments were finished was that the case and and it took them like another two or three weeks to finish everything um, which partly might be because our design is actually quite symmetrical so what can happen is that the 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 the, the, area, the DNA you synthesize can, for example, form loops or kind of bend in on itself. Or um, anyway, they had a hard time finishing everything and getting to quality control. <clears throat> and we were a lot on the phone with uh, Christoph Misch, Misch from Eurofins, who actually came to the exhibition in Vienna. So that was really cool. And he looked totally different than what we expected on based on the voice. <laughs> um, yeah. So the synthesized DNA. Um, Third part is the experimental design. Uh, so the primers and the guide RNA. Um, this was ma mainly Federico's part in, uh, and we use Benchling for it, which is a nice free, I think still software, um, which feels very natural and is kind of Google, Google Docs for uh, uh, collaborating on DNA projects. And you can actually align the primers and the guide RNAs and see exactly like where am I gonna cut. And that's the design of the experiment. And of course, to do it and to test whether it worked is, a, is, a, is the next step. And the fourth part is a fourth step uh, here is uh, gathering materials. Um, yeah, so for example, we had to gather RNAs free materials as much as possible because we work with, um, because it's in vitro. So the RNA, um, which is used by the CRISPR system is not protected by any cell. And RNAs are kind of these enzymes that break down RNA. And we had to make sure that we work really clean to prevent them from breaking down our, our, our experiment, basically. Um, so we got our, like RNAs free pipe tips. And at some point, we also needed chloroform because we did chloroform uh, did it, uh, chloroform extraction um, after a purification step. And we got it from the University of Amsterdam. And actually, the guy who, who gave it to us didn't know that plastic, uh, that chloroform melts plastic. So then that we got it and we, we, we went to the lab with it and like our whole tube was flimsy and we had to quickly pour it into a glass where, well, anyway, it was a big adventure, the gathering of material. Um, and when we had it, we could really start. Oh, this is a, a screenshot of the a third step. So this is like the design of the experiment we did in uh, Benchling. Um, and here we had the, all the bull fragments um, and you see kind of the length. Uh, and actually Benchling shows already like the things you see there on there um, are actually the um, uh, restriction enzymes, that you, the, which are an enzyme that cut in a specific area that you could use to cut this DNA. So that's kind of a nice feature of the, of the software. Um, and we had all the bool fragments in there and kind of a total overview of the experiment as well. Um, next step, second step, the amplification of the DNA fragments. Um, this was basically a, a, a three steps which we repeated a lot, which is first the amplification of the DNA fragments using PCR, uh, uh, secondly to check on the gel whether it worked, and, um, and then we loaded actually everything on the gel and we cut it out uh, if needed, um, and then we purif purified it using a spin column purification, which are kits that, that, that you can, you want to get rid of all the, all the things in your tube, like the you kind of primer dimers, which kind of your primers you use for the PCR amplification can form little pieces which you want to get rid of. And there's other stuff uh, you might want to clean up as well. So there's uh, that's where the spin column purification things come in. And um, yeah, most of my pictures from this period actually are kind of pictures from the gel we run. So we use this small IO rodeo gel, which is I think also an open source, uh, or I'm, I'm sure it's an open source um, electrophoresis. Um, gel box um, and how it works. Basically you load you load your um, uh, samples on this gel and you put a current over it. So the DNA, which is negatively charged goes down. And um, we added uh, cyber green uh, to the gel, which attaches to the DNA. So it will uh, glow green when you add a 
when you have blue light, so there's blue light in behind and there's an orange filter in front of it. So you actually see the, um, yeah, you can see the DNA on the gel. And here we, this is actually the, the amplified bull fragment, I think one of the first, which we then compare with the letter. In this case, we had a, 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 a thousand base pair letter and our fragments were um, eight, nine, 950 base pairs. So you see they're actually bigger than the, bigger than the letter. Um, yeah. Next step in the process is the guide RNA synthesis. Um, oh yeah, and I wanted to make sure like, so this is the part we're gonna do uh, on Monday. And actually Jose in Porto uh, already did the amplification um, last week of the um, Boo fragments, which he got sent from, from Waag in Amsterdam to Portugal. So um, we can confirm that the Boo fragments we used in Deelboon are still, um, alive and not degraded, you amplified them. Um, and what we're gonna focus on on Monday is like the, the step three and four, which I'll go through now. Um, yeah, so step two is the guide RNA synthesis. Um, we actually um, use the kit for this. Um, and what it does basically is it synthesizes guide RNA from substrate DNA. So you can order um, double stranded DNA with, with the specific sequence. Oh, what's this? Um, well, with a specific sequence um, to, uh, uh, and then copy that into uh, RNA. Did somebody draw a circle on my screen? Is, did somebody else see that as well? Ah, oh, it's gone, anyway. Um, and yeah, we use this kit for that, um, which is the NGen guide RNA synthesis kit. Uh, it's from S, Pyogenes, which is a streptococcus, so it originally comes from um, uh, from the system in this streptococcus bacteria, um, and basically what it does is um, yeah, so you need to make like a target specific oligo, which is the DNA, and then in this reaction um, following this kit. Basically, it, it, in the tube is this a scaffold from the um, uh, S, uh, Cas9 scaffold oligo, which is kind of the part that will bind to the um, Cas9 protein. Because if you remember from the CRISPR system, you have like the part, you have like the, the, the what's called here the target specific sequence, which is the part that, that, that finds in your DNA, uh, the targets in your DNA where you want to cut. And like the other part of this guide RNA is, uh, is the part that actually attaches to the Cas9 um, protein, which you will need for the kind of molecular scissors to work. And what this kit does is basically the, you order um, you order your sequence, which has then this uh, promoter, but also this target specific sequence, which is the 20 nuclei that we want to cut and an overlap. And basically, it it, it creates this bigger uh, it fuses these things together. So you have your in the end, you will end up with your target specific sequence and the uh, 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 part that binds to the cast line and we actually will get rid of the get rid of the promoter because the promoter is there for the um, um, RNA polymerase to um, to bind which which reads off the DNA and creates this RNA copy just like happens in cells but now actually because it's all in vitro so we don't have cells so it, it, it you kind of take this um, uh, machinery you could say kind of molecular machinery which is normally in cells and do it in in tubes. And so it's a single tube reaction assessed here at uh, 37 degrees Celsius, 30 minutes, and then it's done. Um, and the next step is uh, Cas9 cutting. So first you uh, design the RNA, now we're gonna cut. Um, yeah, which basically we add the um, Cas9 proteins um, with, a, yeah, with a protocol to add the guide RNAs and a Cas9 and our template DNA and it will cut. Then we uh, load it on a gel. Um, and what we actually did is we cut out the parts which we needed in the um, further experiment because as you remember, we had this bull's head picture and we wanted to cut out the part with the eyes. Um, and then we wanted to add another um, eyes, another fragment with new eyes, which means we had to get rid of the fragment with the eyes, right, with the old eyes. So we actually load everything on a gel, we cut out the the bigger fragments and, 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 and to work with that in the next step. 
Um, here's some pictures to uh, illustrate. So this is the actually the Cas9 nuclease, which is the um, yeah Cas9, and then the Cas nuclease buffer. Um, and this is actually one of the first gels where it worked. Um, so you see here on the most right, uh, you see the letter which we used to compare it to, which goes until um, one thousand base pairs and on the fifth lane you see the the the, the bull fragments which is then about two thousand base pairs and on the left you see different um different configurations of cuttings so um i think the first one is just with one of the uh, guide rnas the second one is with the second guide rna and then the fourth one is with both guide RNAs, if I'm correct, and you see kind of that the, the, the fragments get cut into different um, sizes of fragments all the time. So this was actually our confirmation that the, the cutting had worked, which was really cool because the first time, uh, I didn't say that yet, but the first time actually, uh, our first attempt, it, uh, it didn't work because we had uh, actually a day between this third and fourth step and the third being the guide RNA synthesis and the fourth, the Cas9 cutting. And we think the, that the the, the, the guide RNA is actually degraded in that in that night in between. I mean, we tried to work really clean and we tried to put them in the freezer and uh, we put them in the freezer and such, but still, um, um, well, still it didn't work. And the second time, one thing we did different was do it in one go. Um, and then we had success, which is great. This is this picture. Uh, yeah, so in the end, we put, again, I'll show this picture already. We put everything on a gel and we cut out the, the um, I think the two middle lanes here, uh, which are kind of the two sides of the bull's head around the around the eyes, and we kind of left the eyes, and then we purified it, and then we went to the next step, which is the last step, which is the fusion PCR step, um, where we used the yeah, where we um, well first we amplified the eye fragment, um, which we were going to fuse in there, and then we performed the fusion PCR with primers on both sides of the. Uh, new fragment, uh, so the so the polymerase chain reaction uh, amplifies the the two fragments as one. So from two we could make, or from three we could make like one big fragment. That was then loaded on a gel, it creates a gel again and purified, and sent it for sequencing to get the final result. Um, and here you see on the left the original bulls head uh, picture, and in the middle is kind of the desired outcome, and on the right is the actual outcome. So as you see the the um, the bull head, the, 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 the eyes got inserted into the bull's head, but you do, you do see some different colors because of uh, indel mutations or also because of um, maybe sequencing errors because the fragment was really long um, to sequence also. Um, yeah, so these are the five work steps we did. Um, I'm gonna have, have a little bit more pictures to show you, but if you have any questions also, um, can either write in the chat, which I do have open here, or you can uh, just call out. Um, yeah, I wanted to go a little bit more in the uh, conditions we did this in, and so and I will also answer your question, Lucas, why we did this in vitro, um, because the context we did return to the moon in is um, at the open wet lab of Waag, and. Um, I think the reason it's called in vitro or, or cell free, it's also called so without cells is two part one uh, because of the novelty aspect, but second and maybe more importantly, it's also kind of a reaction to the um, regulations for genetic engineering in the, um, the local regulations. So, so in the Netherlands, we would not have been allowed to do this experiment um, in cells. Uh, because then it would be uh, fall under the genetic regulation, uh, um, yeah, and, and the laws that are for that. And we at at Waag actually there is a it has a special um, S1 uh, GMO status, but this means that for every new experiment, um, uh, there's a whole process of months of writing to the ministry and getting an answer back or not uh, to to get approval for a certain genetic modification. Um, Experiment which I did for the I think the P glow kit which which glows bacteria in the dark with GFP, um, but actually for this experiment we talked about it as well with the with with Per the safety uh, Per Stalgar the safety officer, 
and he gave it very little chance if he would uh, uh, ask the full experiment because, of course, um, it does require kind of a lot of trial and error and, and things that might that you might have to change and differ and and uh, and it's not like a standard um, uh, educational kit which has been tested a hundred times to work in one go. Um, and it also, of course, took a bit longer. Um, but yeah, this, this is the Open Wet Lab at Waag. Um, Roland, can I uh, quickly uh, ask you? So, so did you did you do this mere because of uh, practical reasons, or um, was it also because, um, yeah, you, uh, if if you would have told the um, the health and safety uh, uh, institutions uh, and RIVM uh, that you do this um, in vitro? What do you think would have been their reaction? Well, yeah, we actually we did. I think we had conversation about this with people that work there. And I think because it's in vitro, um, you don't modify anything, not any, anything living. It, it's chemistry up until the point where you involve living organisms. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but it's not only for this. I just wanted to highlight this. Now, it's also... Um, I think it actually it's also the first time this in vitro experiment is used in the context of art or bio art. Uh, and I also like that it's some that is done in kind of this biohacking uh, environment where we try to kind of. Um, so, it's, so it's not bio art. Yes. Uh, Winter wants to add something. I yeah, just want to tell you. We were talking about the, the different me methods of gene editing before, like Jose pointed out, like the zinc fingers and you have Luxet and all those kinds of things. But it was, uh, was also like remarkable from this point of view that it is now possible for artists. I mean, they need some kind of uh, structural connection to academia and his Fede and he's a trained biologist, like um, highly trained biologist. But it was still possible with um, a few thousand euros to do this because like five or ten years ago it would have cost it like 30,000, 300,000 euros you know to do like the, the, the same small experiment which is actually just like removing a few base pairs and adding a few base pairs but it would have like needed maybe a few professors it would have needed a, a different kind of infrastructure and, and money behind the experiment like this. And now it was possible in vitro with off the shelf products. It was not like that we developed our own CRISPR system. We used the one we could buy on the market you now. And it was possible to pull off experiment like that with uh, products you, you just can, if you know how to use it, you, you can buy. I mean, it still needed a biologist. It was not like that. Some completely random can person can do experiments like that, but it was possible in an environment like that, with a very small budget, to perform the experiment. And that this yeah. is a big game changer, you know, also for biologists because they would have maybe written a thousand letters to you know to get permission to use so much money for an experiment and justify it with I don't know what. But right now the question. Let, let's see what happens and do it, you know, it's just like possible. Yeah, that, that was also more or less the fashion within which you as um, uh, uh, buyer and hacker enthusiasts came together and uh, formed this coalition of four uh, artists, um, uh, biohackers to do this in the open wet lab because it wasn't given that much um, attention within even Waag. Uh, at the time. It happened during the open evenings and then you took more time, more time, more time. Um, I think it's interesting and uh, uh, to mention here, because it's not that much known, uh, the lab you're uh, looking at now, the Open Wet Lab of Waag, is just a room uh, with a table uh, in the Waag building. Uh, with lots of stuff that you can do uh, basic molecular biology with. Uh, but of course, um, if you do serious uh, genetic engineering, you would not be allowed because there is um, national and European legislation that prevents that. 
Um, the lab, however, like Roland mentioned, got um, a um, biosafety permit uh, to work with genetic modified organisms. However, that bandwidth is very small because the only, the, the only standard permission we have is to do um, viral transfection to get uh, a GFP protein into an E. coli bacterium, which is in a lot of educational kits. Uh, but we got that permission because of a number of artworks. Uh, one of the first was um, uh, an artwork um, made uh, by Adam Zaretsky called Errorarium, where he used zinc fingers, zinc fingering to um, uh, change uh, an Arabidopsis uh, form in the end, uh, but also the work of Charlotte Jarvis. Uh, in which Per Stauhart are at that time uh, extremely interested in art biosafety um, uh, experts um, helped us to get a permit for um, where Charlotte was putting uh, the first uh, few lines of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights into um, the genome of um, a fungus. Uh, and the work by Howard Boland uh, of C Lab, where they worked with uh, genetically modified uh, bacteria that were uh, having magnetic um, characteristics. So all these three requests for permission to have these works of art exhibited um, or made uh, were were not uh, permitted by. Um, uh, the European or the, or the Dutch uh, authorities, but because they got uh, those requests for permit, they started a discussion about it, which in the end led to um, yeah the agreement that uh, for educational purposes, for them which which for them includes the arts um, uh, within biosafety regulations, they would permit. Uh, genetic engineering to be done in laboratories like this, if all um, biosafety measures are met. So that is an interesting uh, uh, change. In that sense, we became uh, uh, Netherlands' first uh, uh, certified laboratory that was not connected to any, uh, uh, um, uh, any university at all. Yeah, maybe I come back to this uh, uh, tomorrow again, but, but uh, at the same time, I thought it was interesting to quickly mention this story because it's not that known. Uh, and it very much relates also to the fact that you have thought uh, for Return to Dilmun to use uh, an in vivo model, but in the end, uh, for good reasons, chose to, uh, to, to, to develop a uh, in vitro model. Yeah. Maybe I like to kind of wrap up the, um, the last few slides I uh, have left. Um, uh, thank you, Lucas, for the explanation. Inger asks, do you need a safety level one for return to Dilmun? Am I allowed to the in vitro part of my kitchen sink lab? Um, uh, I think so. Let me get back to that later. Um, I, th I think because in the end, no, I think because in the end, um, but that's different in the countries that people, that other people are in. Uh, but if I remember correctly for the Netherlands biosafety level, um, uh, this is in vitro, so basically it's a, it's a chemistry uh, experiment that you don't really use any modified organisms. So um, I think you would just be able to do this in your Laboratory, which also can be a high-tech laboratory in your own kitchen, in your own kitchen, right? Um, I think so. Anyway, let me continue for the last pictures that I've left. So this picture uh, you're looking at now for a while is uh, made in the height of our busyness because it looks very messy. Um, uh, but <laughs> what you see is um, like Gunther also pointed out on the left. You see this big bleach bottle because we use 10% bleach to. Um, clean everything all the time because actually RNases, so the enzymes that break down RNA are um, not always destroyed by high, high percentage of, of ethanol. Um, so it, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, more, um, 
uh, regular to use temps and bleach. And then we use this camping gas, oh yeah, camping gas burner. You see there on the left as well um, as our flame to work with uh, to create kind of this sterile umbrella environment where the hot air goes up and you can work uh, around it, um, which worked fine all the times we used it. But you see also these jam jars or like marmalade jars. That's actually where we autoclave the um, uh, Eppendorf tubes in to extra autoclave it. And then what else? Well, you see in the middle, the, the, the other clays are actually pressure cookers, um, which work fine. It's the same principle because with the high pressure, the temperature reaches 130 degrees. And um, yeah, so we uh, other clays, a lot of things. Although the tips we did, were, we got were also uh, RNAs free because apparently our, the enzyme RNAs um, doesn't always break down because of other Claving, whereas DNA is that does. Um, and what else do you see? We see the the, the gel, uh, uh, the gel system we use to make gels. Um, and also, I think this Gunther laptop on the chair uh, connected to the open PCR, which is the on the table there, which is the open source uh, uh, PCR machine we use to amplify the the frequency. Um, yeah, and on the right is the the the, the way. Well, what you call it? This the the scale. Um, yes, yeah, so I think basically 90% of everything we use is actually in this picture, including all the pipettes and tips and <laughs> yeah, microwave. Um, this is me as well. So here you see a bit how we work. We worked, um, here we were loading a gel. We also use these gloves and we were um, cleaning a lot of our hands as well all the time. And Gunja would come and spray some extra bleach and we were like clean the outside of the gloves. I think in, in, in a lot of ways, we are super well prepared for the current pandemic because we washed our hands so and we sterilized everything so much that it's, uh, I would not say a second nature, but kind of we're used to uh, this kind of hyper focus where you have to work really sterile. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, and here also you see on the right, on the, I'm sorry, on the, on the, on the bottom, you see the, the, the ice, which is in a foam, like wood water and ice pack, which is for the, I think the Cas9 nucleases in the, and, and enzymes you always want to keep um, cold for as long as possible because you don't want them to start uh, working already. Um, and you, you were uh, working very close to the flame, you know, we were like just almost like yeah. That's what, the danger to, to get burned, you know, you're very close to the yeah. flame and trying not to touch that's stuff with a hand we were hiding a few of the pipette tips because you know that's like just normal curiosity in humans like everybody opens a bag touches you know <laughs> to prevent stuff like that yeah it's true we also had to deal with other users of the laboratory <laughs> to keep our stuff keep our stuff clean uh yeah last time actually i think jose Beza said it might not be necessary to work with the flame but yeah we did it's also uh, of note that kind of the lag is really an old mostly wooden building so um there's also kind of a lot of spores and things in the air. So we have to work really, uh, um, well, really try to clean all the surfaces and support and support. Yeah, yeah, and this is another um, picture of the action. I think I'm about there. Oh yeah, this, <laughs> this is kind of a compilation I had of, uh, uh, I was looking at how many gel pictures are in our, uh, archive and I think we made around 30 to 40 electrophoresis channels, uh, which is a lot, but this is also because the first time so the gas line cutting didn't work and so forth. Um, so yeah, and these gels are partly to check whether it worked um, and to optimize the protocol, but also partly uh, we did this thing where we loaded everything we had on a gel. So we kind of taped the combs in the tray together. So you would get like this big line, uh, uh, yeah, big line in, in the, in the, in the, Agarbrose gel, and then we would load all the DNA in there and uh, pull it through with the electrophoresis and then cut it out and purify it again. Um, but yeah, we were super happy that in the end it worked, and this is the result, as you saw already. Um, that was it. These were the steps. Any any other questions? Roland, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, it's about the picture that you just uh, showed about the bowl, the, your last uh, outcome. Um, I was wondering, because I have no idea, uh, why the difference in coloring that you get on the pixels? Is there any reason behind that? 
or is just a... Yeah, um, I will start and then Gwinder can finish the explanation. But okay. uh, that's because the algorithm uh, is made such that like every color is translated into a certain base pair combination, right? And um, so every pixel is a certain number of base pairs in the DNA. And this means that if these uh, pixels get either like indel mutations or you get sequencing errors, which, which, which will uh, uh, mean that, that the pixel is maybe not, that, that, that the base pair is maybe not the base pair you want to have at that location. But this means that the, the combination of base pairs becomes different and a different color will come out in the translation algorithm we have. Because every, every, yeah, it's just like in Photoshop where you have like the screen with the colors and it translates into a certain hex code. It's a bit similar, but then with, DNA, like every every uh, DNA base pair code can correspond to a different color. So when the base pairs change, you get different, um, yeah, different colors. Is that correct, Gunther? Yes, uh, th th that's actually correct. And so we, we had like the those two kinds of experiments. So we had like the on target um, experiments with ten to base pairs, and then what should come out is just like the bull with the eyes without those um, different colors. And so, but it was in the beginning. So I still had, the, I had myself had like the, uh, had the concept of CRISPR-Cas9 that it works like, like it's portrayed in mass media all the time. That's it's like 100% precise, you know, that you like get, no. get this precision cuts like you do like in electronics, you, 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 you connect to, to kind of wires and the, the LED goes on and it will be all the time that way and it will never change. And that's just like how the precision. <coughs> and so that's why we had like the, this, the, the second kind of experiments um, off target with a smaller sgRNA with 15 and 12 nucleotides, because I thought like from an artistic point of view, if you just do the on target experiment, you will have the bull and then you have the bull with the eyes and um, that's just um, aesthetically boring and and everybody could ask why did you do this on a molecular level because you don't have to do this you can do this in photoshop and and doesn't make sense and so just to, to have a few of this pixelation in it we we made the we made the um, off target experiments but then in the end what, what it turns out is that the on target experiment um, yielded the uh, the way more <laughs> interesting um, uh, uh, mutations and changes, which we uh, which we didn't foresee or which we didn't hope for, and then it actually it it it, it uh, outrun the the off target experiments, so they become less interesting because then we're just like random cuts with random. Stuff and the, the actual experiment where, which we, where we saw that we don't have um, any changes, just like having the eyes in, and it just like works like that. And maybe one or two sequencing error, which usually happens, happens in the prior works as well. But it was like just like one pixel. But in the end, then it, it just like turned out that um, for many reasons, maybe. If, if you like, don't have like diffusion PCR, but having the repair in the bacterial cell, maybe you have like less mutations could be, um, we don't know because like, you know, we ran out of money and everything. So we couldn't do like more testing what, what really happened there with the mutations. But it turned out the, the regular experiment uh, in the end turned out cooler mutations than the the off-target experiments. Do you, do you see the off-target now? I'm trying to show it on my screen. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the second. I, I didn't include yeah. this in the in the talk, but this is like the second experiment we did uh, was like what Günther said. Indeed, um, normally we would use like the 20 nucleotide um, target area in the um, in the um, in the first experiment uh, where we replace the eyes. But in the second, we also use this 20 nucleotide and 15 nucleotide to get. So basically, we wanted to get uh, target cuts because of this off-target um, effect of CRISPR, which basically means like cut at the places you don't want it to cut. It's like a huge discussion in CRISPR also with regards to healthcare um, applications and so forth. Um, like how precise is the technology really? And then and these are the these are the outputs of that. So that we have these four um, four outputs. Yeah. I have a question regarding to this 
does it this look like um, like the whole row is changed? And you explain that the image is is well created from top left to to bottom right. So could this be to um, due to a, like a frame shift, like a single deletion or an addition, and then the whole row changes, or is it that every single uh, pixel is actually changed? No, I think I think you see it in this way because we actually see we actually see it in four parts. So um, because the whole DNA was too big, so we, we we did it in four separate parts of the bull head. So like the top, uh, middle, middle, bottom, bottom part, and that's why I see it like this. Um, yeah, and then we also actually have one picture where they are all compiled, so the whole thing looks looks colorful. Yeah, Gunther, what do you want to say? You're muted. Yeah, uh, I can show you. Yes, uh, this is because of the things. But uh, in the second, in the off-target experiments, it's true that in the end, uh, it was hard to tell if it's a shortcoming what exactly I mean, that there are random cuts and random mutations in the fusion PCR, but there are also some sequencing errors and there's also a little bit of shortcoming in the software. Because if you make like a hundred random cuts and you have like the DNA part of like, you have like two small strands you and it, it's um, put together with fusion PCR again, you don't know which part is, uh, it's, you know, the, the whole row is interrupted and you don't know in which direction the diffusion PCR, does it start now with a piece from the end or is it a piece in the middle? So we, we got lost, uh, we lost the track on, on, on what really happened there in the, I mean, the on target experiments, it's easy. You could do the alignment very easily and it, it's, it's kind of, uh, uh, a true representation, but in the off-target experiments, it's hard to tell what was really going on. That's true. Just try to show it like all in. Hey, um, um, oh, just I a sec. A oh. Question: Can I ask a final question? Then I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> it's a final question because I think people crave for lunch also. I think so as well. Yeah. Now I was I was wondering because the the way that this um, you you stated in the beginning, Günther, that about uh, nine uh, kb uh, kbp is about the maximum length. Um, is that due to the properties of the molecule itself, like folding into itself, something like that Roland also said, or could you, in essence, make it bigger? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? I didn't understand what what. That the um, that the like the nine thousand base pairs uh, that this picture is is kind of the maximum we can do, also in a different lab. In, in in Harvard or something you, you you stated, and is that due to the properties of a of the molecule, the DNA molecule itself, like folding and and stuff like that? Yes, I'm convinced, but I'm uh, uh, I, I I could be wrong too. That like I underestimate the capabilities of uh, other labs, maybe. But that was just like the experiment. Uh, that that was just like what what I noticed in. In this and, and the last um, three experiments, that you have some kind of um, a glass ceiling when it comes to base pair and when it comes to repeat, because like like I told you, the the kind of information that nature stores into the DNA is totally different to human. Because here, like like what was also like what I did in 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 the, in the when I designed the bull in the graphics program, what I did, I designed half a bull. And then it just mirrored the other half, you know, it's just like to make it easier for you or, you know, it's just like those techniques used in graphic design to make stuff quicker and easier. But in the end, like uh, translated into DNA again, it, it turned out, I mean, when it was already too late, when we already sent it into Eurofins, it turned out that this kind of repeats um, uh, makes it harder to work with that kind of molecule than in the end. But that with the folding, it, it's, the, the, the folding is a problem with every um, artificial construct you have, I guess. I mean, Jose can maybe show a little bit more, more light on that, but that's really a problem. The, uh, if you have like artificial contracts over 9,000 and more base pairs, 
So that was a little bit, you know, because uh, I was like making a lot of bulls and I was making one with 60 to 60 pixels and send in, you know, the DNA and ask what they could do. And the, um, how you say, the more reliable company said that's not so possible or it takes too long or it's just like a crazy amount of money that they need and they're not sure if they care, can guarantee the result for every single base pair because actually that's what you want when you when you synthesize it. You want exactly having every base pair in, 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 in that row. Other, it's just like, yeah, it could happen that's arbitrary, you know, like uh, arbitrary order of base pairs will happen then we don't know, are the mutations coming from the synthesis or is it coming from our procedures? So that's, that, that's, that's like the, the question that comes here. Just looking here for the... Yeah, I, I, th I think it, for a later moment, it's very interesting to, uh, to talk more about this, what you asked, uh, how you challenged uh, the company that, uh, uh, that needed to send you the sequence back. Mm -hmm. Just like uh, for a short time, I will think that uh, I can um, just like how it would look like if you put all the four different parts together in one. So just like if, you know, that's how much the, the off-target uh, experiment would like alter the pictures. And what you can see also in the small parts like you roll and choke before, um, it, it never included the eyes. So like having the, the, the eyes in the image showed us also that the fusion PCR worked because if it wouldn't have worked, we couldn't see the eyes in the sequencing. You know?